Be that as it may, we, in common with the whole community, hail with pleasure the inauguration of the railway in Queensland. An old woman in our carriage was very proud of this little bit of railroad. Hello and welcome to the first Queensland Rail podcast. Our podcast is very much like the beginnings of Queensland Railways in 1865, a journey into the rich tapestry that is the story of Queensland, a story of iron and steel, of timber and tin, and most importantly, people. People think about the railway and the iconic images of the steel train, rolling stock, railway lines, stations, but so much of our history is the result of hard work and vision of people. Not only nearly 160 years, but even today. My name is Annette and with me is Greg. Greg, would you like to introduce yourself? Indeed, thank you Annette. Well, for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Greg Hallam. I'm the historian for Queensland Rail. I've been working with the story of the Queensland Railways uh, for uh, the entire of my 21st century, literally. Um, And I've been working professionally in the historical field and cultural heritage field for over 25 years now. A little bit of additional background too, Annette. I am a third generation railway family member here. Although my wife, her family, uh, uh, her f- railway precedent beats me hands down because her great grandfather started here at Toowoomba in 1899, uh, here at uh, Toowoomba in the, in the engine shed. So, um, yeah, I'm part of that great family of the, the Queensland Railway people I'm very proud to be a, a member of. So, I've been with Queensland Rail for 14 years now. I've had many different roles, but now I work in our community partnerships team, which I like to say is the nice and fluffy of Queensland Rail. My team and I conduct the community education. So we go out to the schools, the kindergartens and community groups and educate the kids on rail safety. I personally get to do the kindergartens and I love how excited our little kids get about anything to do with Queensland Rail. Mm. We also do the community partnerships, which means we talk with charities and community groups and see how we can assist and start partnerships with them. Added bonus, Greg, so I get to work with you. And you seem to have an answer for every left field historic question I can throw at you. <laughs> oh, well, as I can, the best way of putting that is with many years comes much experience. And, uh, oh, well, as I said, in the world of history, I mean, we're as much storytellers as interpreters and things like that. And uh, as I said, it's my job to help. It's my job to answer the questions. And more importantly, bring a lot of those interesting and fascinating stories to life in it. Greg, would you like to explain where we're recording our first podcast today? Oh, pretty much home and host for me in a lot of ways, Annette. This is uh, Toowoomba Railway Station. It's a beautiful um, Italianette-style building. It was um, built by uh, Godsell uh, um, in 1874 up here in Toowoomba. There's actually a street up near uh, Queen's Park called Godsell Street, which is named after him. Um, It's one of a handful of masonry stations in Queensland. The central core where we are today was actually built in 1874. Um, Like many things in the railways, it's been added to over the years and things have been taken off and that. Um, But... uh, 20 years ago they did a lot of conservation work on the station here and the basis of it is the 1874. There was a previous structure here from 1867 that was pretty much a timber and tin thin. Very humble station because the colony ran out of money in 1866 and a much more humble Toowoomba station came as a result. Do you want to tell us about the loft where you work, Greg? <laughs> oh yes, the loft. It's one of those very humble railway affairs anyway. and. Uh, Actually, it's, it's really a bit of a survivor because, you know, it was, uh, as I said before, you know, so many of these stations and we've been added to and added to and added to over the years. When you see, like, you know, the cobbles and the cobblations of um, different buildings and that, very humble little affair, though, but it was actually the guard's loft, as it was called. Um, and it's, uh, there was also an adjoining part building used to be for porters. So the railway porters who used to work here. And it's a survivor from an earlier time. Um, there's one part of it's 1908, the other part's 1914. And it's really just a survivor because there's a lot more buildings around there when you see um, papers and things like that that um, go back in time. But, uh, but that's the interesting thing. Like, so many of these places and buildings, you know, the cultural heritage people would tell you, I mean, these places, they're books, they're stories. And you can look at a building and I'll tell you a story, things added to, things taken away from. And a historian or someone like that or a person who understands, like, the heritage architects and that, these places tell stories to them and they speak to you. And they tell you a story about you know, what's going on, the uses of the building, the various changes and things like that. And um, it's quite remarkable, I think. Here we are, you know, the you know, early part of the 21st century. This is a building that was built you know, really towards the mid to latter part of the 19th century. And we've got all this wonderful technology here, but 
you know, when it was built in the 1870s, steam trains, the telegraph, the electric telegraph, and it was really, again, of, you know, linking the world and bringing everything connecting together again, connecting Queensland. So um, isn't it great, you know, 150 years on, we were in a place that's still uh, doing that purpose as well. Remarkable. This week marks the 156th anniversary of the Queensland Railways, and we thought, let's start a podcast. No, actually, what better way to start than to look back at where it all began and ended as well at a place called Biggs Camp, now fondly known as Grandchester. Yeah, Biggs Camp, it really is a wonderful place, you know. It's... um. So people say to me, you know, well, why does a railway end, you know, nowhere near Brisbane or anything like that? No, not even within Kiwi, the place. And again, it's going to be one of those things because we're in Queensland. Queenslanders are different. And I said, we even comes to the railway story. But I think one of the things is when you look back, you know, at that time, back then the, uh, the Brisbane Courier and the papers of the day, they were looking forward to the commencement of the railway in Queensland, the introduction of the, well, really the industrial revolution to Queensland. And the headlines of the paper were really, really anticipating this was epoch making. This was something important, you know. I mean, the Brisbane Courier back then actually said, look, be that as it may, we in common with the whole community hail with pleasure the inauguration of the railway in Queensland. It was, it was history. And the thing we've got to realise too, Annette, at that stage as well, is that people were looking forward, you know, to the railway coming to Queensland, but it wasn't done in isolation. And I think that's the important thing. People have been following the story of the railway in Queensland since the uh, Parliament debated its um, the creation, the inauguration and everything like that going back to 1863. The newspaper accounts of the day, they told that this railway was being built and how and where. But everything about that railway and what made it unique is it had to be imported from overseas. And one thing I always like saying to people who grew up with Hornby train sets and Meccano sets and everything like that when they were younger, they have to say, you would have loved to have been there in 1865 because everything was imported from Britain, apart from the timber, and uh, you know, there were local workers involved in it. But so much had to come from Britain, and it was absolutely remarkable when you think about it. It came from half a world away. Um, it was chartered on ships, sailing ships. And you think about steam engines broken down into component parts and that coming out on the decks of clipper ships, you know, large canvas rig ships from half high around the world. And they brought everything over with them as well too, Annette. The other thing too, Annette, you can't think of Queensland being totally cut off from the world or isolated. I know it's state of origin time, people still like to tend to think that sort of thing as well. But the world of the 1860s, it was a time of great technological change. It was social change as well too. When you read the papers, you know, from the beginning of the railway in July of 1865, they were carrying paper you know, in the newspaper accounts, the stories of the report of the assassination of President Lincoln, you know, at the end of the American Civil War. So even that had taken place, what, two, three months before, but they were having the full newspaper accounts. So at the time, you know, the railway had been introduced to Queensland was being seen as some great, you know, scientific, technological marvel that was being introduced. But people also had an understanding basically of what else was going on around in the world at that stage. So it wasn't cut off, it wasn't isolated or anything like that. And um, <clears throat> I know in this world of you know, the uh, internet, uh, Instagram and all those sorts of things and Facebook, you know, we talk about connection. I mean, we go back, you know, 150, 160 years ago, the electric telegraph was there. It had made the world so much smaller. And the other great engine of change of that was literally the railway that went with it. We've got to remember, Queensland was a large colony. It was enormous, with a very small uh, European population. Most of that clustered in the southeast of the state. I think it was about 35,000 people or something like that. And it was an enormous, you know, it's an enormous colony. Uh, we'd only separated from New South Wales back in 1859. And so, you know, we're really into the piece with the railway story in that. But what had happened was that um, uh, our Premier of Queensland, then Premier Herbert, in 1862 and 1963, he travelled over to uh, London and he actually found at that stage it was available money, credit, you know, and the government could take out these very, very large loans, you know, um, from the London money market. And uh, basically it was done with reasonable terms and without great difficulty, you know. So it was public money that was available and, you know, funding of a railway is going to be enormous for it anyway. So when he returned to Queensland, he actually promoted that, a government control railway, which would basically, you know, take it out of private enterprise hands and the government would direct the railway where it would go and everything like that. Now, a key supporter of, for us in Queensland was an Ipswich-based solicitor and politician Arthur McAllister. 
He actually became a speaker in the in the uh, Queensland Parliament. I think his nickname was also Slippery Mac. You know, so we won't go into politics and that. But um, he would actually he actually pushed very hard, and it went to the Public Works Department, if memory serves me correct, um, for the you know, construction of the railway and everything like that. Uh, McAllister was Secretary for Lands and Public Works, and um, it was basically these two had so much of an important impact on our first railway type of design and even the early station buildings. So in 1863 in May, I introduced the first bill into Queensland, into the Parliament, and it passed with a very small majority in the Legislative Assembly, which is the lower house then, and then the Legislative Council, which used to be the upper house, it went there in September of 1863. And uh, it, was, it was fought, you know, because people said, why are we going for, what's this question of gauge? And they opted for the three foot six gauge and the consultant who actually worked on it at the time, I bought him from overseas and his name was Abram Fiskibben. He was Irish, um, a very interesting character indeed. And he was quite famous or infamous because when he was called to Parliament to actually talk about this choice of gauge, because the idea was, you know, why go for a narrow gauge and the standard gauge, four foot eight and a half, then being used in New South Wales, five foot three in, um, in Victoria and that. And he was quite wonderful. And Fitzgibbon, actually, he, he must have kissed the Blarney Stone. He was remarkable, <laughs> this man. And he actually said to the Queensland Parliament, it's better to go 500 miles at 15 miles an hour than 250 miles at 25 miles an hour. And you hear someone like that saying, look, I can get you so much more for so much less than what you want sort of thing. And basically for the Queensland government, they realised at that stage, look, we've got this amount of money we're we going to borrow and spend. And we've been told by, you know, um, this uh, engineer, he will give us this. And that's where the entire thing about, you know, the, the question of gauge came around to as well anyway, you know. In 1863, I think it was December, uh, Fitzgibbon was appointed our first commissioner for Queensland Railways and he reported directly to Arthur McAllister as well. And they actually called for uh, tenders for the first section of our line, which was um, 33.8 kilometres in the modern currency, about 20, 21 miles, I think it was, in the old currency as well, from its switch and to a place at the Little Liverpool Range. And uh, the contract was let early in 1864, you know, to begin the construction and everything like that. And the company that won the contract, Pedro Brassi and Betts, they were a worldwide construction uh, firm. They'd actually uh, been building since the 1840s, I think it was. They were constructing railways literally around the world, South America, Russia. Um, in, they'd constructed many of the great trunk works in Britain. Uh, they were in the United States and even in Europe and then in the Australian colonies as well too. Is this the one who was famous for always coming in ahead <laughs> of schedule? Not necessarily this crowd, but there are many contractors later on the period who prided themselves on doing that. Pedro Brassi and Betts actually were con have been constructing work in the uh, New South Wales colonies and came here. And uh, yeah, they're quite, they're quite a remarkable company. I think in the 1860s, and as, again, I'd have to check this up, I think they had a worldwide construction workforce of around 150,000 spread around the world. They were building railways everywhere. And it was really a case, you know, even in this day and age, you know, you can go to certain companies or something like that and basically we need a railway and, you know, this is how you do it sort of thing, you know. It wasn't flat pack, I can assure you of that anyway, but uh, oh, ship pack. pretty close, ship pack, yeah. <laughs> yeah, ship pack, that's the way you do it sort of thing. So uh, they were awarded the contract and it was for 86,900 pounds. Precisely. Wow. Mm. How much in today's money is £89,600? <laughs> oh, Annette, I knew you'd ask me that anyway. Um, it's difficult to equate or, you know, to equal in this day and age. Um, there are various, you probably, I think you told me that you were using very historical um, kind of formula and things like that. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. It is a difficult thing. Um, one thing I particularly didn't dislike was back in the 1960s and 70s, they used to decimalise it. So if it was £89,000, they make it, you know, like um, $178,000, which you can't do. Basically, the easiest way, really thinking about, it would have been a multi-billion dollar project in today's uh, terms and everything like that, which we still see with railway projects in this day and age, don't we, sort of thing in it. So, we definitely yeah. do. Mm. I'm just impressed that they closed the contract in January <laughs> and then, what, 18 months later, it's opened the railway line. Well, that's an interesting story. But as we know, Annette, to actually get from cut, uh, to cutting the first sod, which Lady Bowen did, to actually getting that first engine there on uh, the first official trains on the 31st of July, it's still a bit of a story, of course, as you'd appreciate oh, course, anyway. Yes. So, but um, I mentioned before about Lady Bowen, and she actually turned the um, uh, first sod at um, a special ceremony on the 25th of February, 1864. So you think about, they're awarded the contract in January, 
and you know within a, a month or two well six to eight weeks they're actually inaugurating the railway work so you know they got into it and started for, 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 yeah started Full to go from ahead. <laughs> that's a very funny pun well done anyway there in it so that's quite good so yeah Why didn't we make the, the rail here? Did we not have the foundries or anything we to didn't. make our own? That was the interesting thing. Annette, well done. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it up straight away. But we didn't have the industrial capacity for it. Um, if you look at places like Brisbane or Toowoomba here or other places, making our rails and making iron and that, it was a big heavy duty industry. And you've got to remember at that stage, Britain did pride itself on being the workshop of the world. And they were. The Industrial Revolution had started there, you know, in the uh, latter part of the 18th century, early 19th century. So the components and basically the technology that was being advanced there for make the rails, to make everything, was being done there. And it was actually quite easy actually to procure stuff from half a world away and bring it here as well. I actually chartered these ships and... Uh, what came out here was, uh, you know, there was one ship that came out on was the Commodore Perry. Uh, it was a vessel that had been chartered by the Queensland Government and it brought out all the equipment and personnel for the fledgling railway. Um, and the other thing is about it, the railway that came here was in a lot of ways was um, almost like um, a built for spec railway as well too. Um, they've been constructing railways for two generations in Britain and the rest of the world in Europe. And what came out here was very much a British or an English colonial railway. The interesting thing, and I think, you know, this is where I really like you know, exploring the social history side, as we call it, which is the people history and that, is how did we get this railway? It's We mentioned earlier on it's people, and it's about people. Well, that was it. I mean, this book, railway that we had here and we were starting commencement with and the working in that, and it, it was um, lock, stock and boiler barrel. It had to be bought from Britain. That included the people that went with it. Um, I think the labourers who were bought here, was, their, their story is incredible. They were actually recruited halfway around the world. There was actually an agent in, um, uh, operating in, uh, uh, in Britain. His name was Henry Jordan. And he used to go out and basically, you know, <laughs> to go to get people to come to Queensland, you know. Um, the people who came out, they called Jordan's lambs because basically, you know, what they were told um, in Britain or places like that or even Northern Europe, you know, this is what Queensland is like, you know, and what they got here and what they saw was a completely different world, literally sort of thing, you know. But they specifically went for, in this day and age, like you know, skilled or specialist workers. Railway navvies were, uh, as they call them, were the uh, construction workers. And they were valued for these incredible skills, you know, the manual labourers to, you know, build a railway. They actually, um, they came out here and they were expected to work a 10-hour day. Um, they paid 35 shillings a week and 35 shillings was enormous money for that period. Um, I think when the first AIF went over in the Great War for Australians, they were called, what, five bob a, six bob a day tourists or something like that. They were, they were the, some of the best paid soldiers in the world. And, I mean, that's a, a half a century after this. And so, you know, they had to really pay big money to get people to come here to build this railway, you know, and it was, they needed lots of incentives to bring them out there as well too, you know, so. Yep, no, I, I checked into this one as well, trying to value it. Yeah. And from what I can see, it was 20 shillings equaled one pound. So mm. they got one pound, 15 mm. shillings mm. a week. Yeah. Were they working six, seven days a week? They used to work six days a week. Um, generally, they'd have Sunday off or the Sabbath or something like that, although being the railway navvies and the sort of, um, well, basically the, uh, the misbehaviour they used to get up to and were renowned for it from you know, a couple of generations and things like that, was, it was not always a day of rest or anything like that. The other thing too is the, lo is the locomotives and things like that. And uh, the again, with the railway being like the Hornby set, the Meccano set and everything like that, it was actually imported from uh, Britain. They bought four steam locomotives initially uh, from the uh, uh, they were um, little engines from the Avonside Engine Country. So company. they'll brand new engines when they come to Queensland? Well, that's it. And the interesting thing is, um, for those who are really interested, have a look at the first locomotives that were built for the Norwegian railway on the three foot six gauge, because that's where the idea had been pioneered and really imported from by Fitzgibbon and others. Um, their first couple of engines, I think one's name was uh, Harkon or King Harkon. It was exactly the same sort of engines design that was built there for use in Norway that they basically transplanted here to Queensland. There was a difference. And I went to Norway back in uh, 2018. I went to their last section of three foot six gauge there. Um, Sedersdalbarn, and I think the railway is near Kristiansen. And my Norwegian is terrible. I apologise for that, <laughs> of course. But... Um, the locomotives, and they had these wonderful photographs on the wall in their office with the volunteers. 
And I took a look at it and I said, they are the same design as the engines that we had for our first railway in Queensland. And these Norwegian fellows are looking at me with open eyes and said, oh, that is very interesting, Greg. And I said, yes, it is, you know. But their engines were a bit different because they what uh, we called them tank engines. They had uh, side tanks carry water and small bunkers. Our engines, different. We had a tender behind, bad joke, but they had a tender. But the big difference, as I pointed out to them, I said, guess what um, they used to have because open calves in Norway, in snow and that. But I said, Queensland, they looked after us. They had a, some big sunshade, basically, or they had a cut roof covering over the footplate where the driver and the fireman used to be as well. Very similar. Um, and basically it was a standard design as well too, you know. It was, a, it was really lovely. It was all like coming home in a way. I said, you know, our railway story, back to really where it began there in Norway as well, you know. So, yeah. Everything else, again, came from overseas. The uh, passenger carriages and everything like that, they came from, uh, I think it was um, uh, the Ashbury Works over in England. They had to buy everything. Um, <laughs> the remarkable thing is, and I, it still gets me in this day and age, you know, I like to have a look at it, and I said, everything, you know, like the ticket, the ticket books, the rule books, the signalling, the railway employees, all the professional railway people were imported from Britain along with their families and everything like that. So, yeah. It's quite remarkable. And our first locomotive, Irish. It's got an Irish show, a little to it. I had, in years, and uh, when I look at this photograph, there's a lovely little one, and um, I was told many years ago by Gaelic speakers, it's called Fog a Balloch. Fog a Balloch, which means get out of the way, clear the way. <laughs> it's an old Irish uh, Gaelic thing. A couple of uh, theories about it. One, it was the uh, motto of the regiment of the um, Governor of Queensland, uh, George Bowen. Um, which is the Irish Guards, Fogabella, clear the way. Another one it could have been with the Irish who actually were, came here to help build the railway, Fogabella, you know, clear the way as well. So there's quite a couple of other you know, stories that go with it as well anyway. So, so earlier yeah. you said we imported our workforce and our engines from England. Mm -hmm. Did we have Irish come with the English as well? Oh, to be sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually that, they, that was the recruitment that went with, with it. It was remarkable um, because, you know, they, the British Isles, and a lot of Irish, you know, were kind of, uh, navvies and things like that. Um, that's what I said with Fogger Bellic was here. And when you actually go back to the story of the uh, building of the railway here, a lot of the railway construction camps, when they came up the range and everything like that, they were nationality. So you'd have English camps, Irish camps. There was one called Crowshaw's camps. They even had what they called um, Scandinavian camps, but they were actually probably from North Germany. And, you know, so people would be brought under basically from their home country and that. And they'd, they'd work in these camps together for obvious reasons, you know, for language and culture and everything like that. So the Irish were definitely here. And on quite a few occasions later on the piece, they were known for having literally a Donnybrook. Especially on St. Patrick's Day, they used to have a riot as well too. And it's all documented. Um, <laughs> as I said, it was, uh, yeah, it was a pretty wild time, obviously, to be around here in Ned anyway. So, yeah. Taking full advantage of that watering hole at Grantchester, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly right. Oh, they provided their own as well too, I might, you know, but... I suppose why did the line did go, go to Biggs Camp um, at Grantchester? It was very simple. Um, that was basically because the line was um, contracted out in five separate uh, stages um, to construct the railway to build it bit by bit and get it up here to Toowoomba. And Biggs Camp or Grantchester lies at the foot of the Little Liverpool Range. Um, when you would have driven up here today, you would have come over Marburg and places like that, the Minden Range. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's all part of the Little Liverpool Range. So basically, they wanted to get a first section of railway line open, or a paying section, they called it anyway. So, yeah. so what exactly is a paying section? <laughs> it's very simply put, get a section of line open and basically get traffic on it, get passengers, get goods on it and start paying for the, paying for the construction bill, paying Selling for the interest and things like that. Exactly sort of thing, you know. So yeah, it's a standard practice, get that first section of line open and off we get. Uh, Oh, while we did, the other question you asked me a little while back was about Grantchester. You know, this thing about Biggs Camp Grantchester, where that came from. Very simple. You couldn't have the name of the terminus of your first railway in Queensland running to a place called Biggs Camp, okay, B I G G E S. So they played with it. And as our marketing people in this day and age would surely love that as well, they Latinised it. So they used like, um, they, they used Latin words to change it. So Biggs, and the play on that became Grant. Chester is the Latin word for um, a camp or something like that. And that's where the name came from. Biggs Camp was changed to become Grand Chester. So that's where um, you couldn't, t that's why today's Grand Chester, although you go to the railway station there, it's also got formerly known as Biggs Camp as well anyway. And uh, people still call it Biggs Camp, Grand Chester, you know, they just play around with it sort of thing. 
I think one of the questions you had earlier on was, you know, when did our first train officially run? And that was actually on the 11th of January 1865. Again, it was with Fogabella. Um, they lit it up at North Ipswich and it did a test run with a wagon and a carriage, I think, if memory serves me correct. And it took Ipswich by surprise. They didn't know that this test run was being done or anything like that. Imagine this day and age, it was, could be like with NGRs or something like that, rolling out mysteriously in the middle of the night or something like that, or some new train. Uh, this is in broad daylight, and uh, the noise of the first shrieks um, apparently took a lot of people in Ipswich by surprise. Um, apparently the local kids, however, turned up who don't obviously decide not to go to school for the day. They actually got a free ride as well too. And community education, I'm sure would love to hear about that sort of thing anyway, Annette. So yeah. so that was it. So yeah. no, uh, That's just fantastic. So in January of 1865, we ran our first train. So that is literally less than 12 months from when they turned this on. Mm, exactly, you know. So it does give you an idea, like, you know, the things that we've been warded in, the amount of, like, it was this incredible, you know, energy that would have gone with it. And, uh, you know, it certainly wasn't a smooth path. Building a railway is not something for the faint hearted, as I've told many a person in, over the time and everything like that. Well, a 60 hour work week is not for too many people. <laughs> so. No, that's exactly right. Well, we went back to the newspapers of the day, and I mean, again, we spoke about you know, that sense of excitement that was building, building, building for the, um, you know, the commencement of the railway in Queensland. And on the 25th of July, the Queensland Times, they said that preparations were being made for um, officially welcoming the railway age. Um, they declared a public holiday. Um, that was to be on Monday, the, the 31st of July. And you mentioned before, Annette, you were talking about invitations, you know, and people who were being invited to events and everything like that. They actually sent 500 invitations out. They were issued by um, Samuel Wilcox, who was on behalf of Pedro Brassi and Betts, the contractors. Um, they'd also authorised and oh, they were going to run four special trains, you know, to harry, carry all the um, uh, invited guests, the official parties. The locomotives, of course, those first four. Do we know the names of the first four? We do, actually, yeah. which is interesting because Queensland never had a big policy of naming locomotives, unlike the British and other parts of the world. So our first four, we mentioned Fogabellic before, uh, again, part of my Gaelic. Um, we had Lady Bowen, named after the, um, like the wife of the governor. There was also um, Pioneer because it was the first one, or, you know, beginnings. And the other one was, um, there was uh, Lady Bowen, there was um, uh, Premier. And Premier because it means... Premier, uh, Premier and Pioneer. That's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and Premier was basically you know, not so much after the Premier of the day, but also because, uh, again, a first or something like that, you know, Premier, so number one. So you can see, you know, the thing was that basically, you know, it was about, you know, the importance, the beginning and everything like that that went with them. So they decided that they'd actually, um, with the opening, um, they would have the uh, big official event, as I mentioned, 500 invitations are sent out and everything like that. Yeah. All right. So they've come down. Where did they catch the first train from? <laughs> did it start in Ipswich or start up at Biggs Camp? They certainly did. Yeah. The train services actually uh, really began on the. Um, they actually began on the Saturday, Saturday, the 29th of July, and on Sunday, the 30th of July, and that was to bring people actually to to Ipswich for the event. So they actually ran trains in from Biggs Camp carrying uh, people who come down from Toowoomba and places like that. So they ran back to Ipswich, but Ipswich was going to be the place where all the first trains departed from, and Grantchester was going to be, you know, the place where the, that major opening event was going to be held from as well too there, Annette, anyway. So, what mm. was the grand opening event that they were all headed to? <laughs> oh, Annette, I knew you'd love this one anyway. It was basically, it was going to be held in, um, it was, uh, they erected a large temporary marquee, and it was at the railway works um, where they're building a tunnel through the Little Liverpool range. And it was um, the Little Liverpool tunnel, still there today, still used as part of the Western Line. There was actually, Grantchester was, as the station was bypassed on the opening day. And the four trains ran up towards these tunnel works. And so it was so when people actually got there, they could detrain and see the tunnelling works being dug, this tunnel being dug. They actually walked up a hillside to um, a large, they called it a plateau or a hillside that overlooked the railway works. So you actually could look back down towards Grantchester or Biggs Camp. You'd look towards the tunnel works where the navvies would have been working. And there was this huge marquee that was there. Um, apparently it was all decked out in greenery. You got 500 people you know, coming in for you know, a very big champagne fueled event and everything like that. And there was also the great big banner in uh, Gaelic that was strung across the uh, entry to the uh, tent and it said, uh, Shin Malia Fulcher. Again, my pardon for my Gaelic and that. 
100,000 welcomes. So you asked about the Irish influence before. It was there as well too, Annette, anyway. so must be yeah. a lot of Irish people who were working on the railways. It's a big influence there. <laughs> I know, and because uh, several generations of them are still with us in Queensland Rail as well too, Annette. But, uh, yeah, so that was the opening. Um, the 31st of July was actually the official date that was set down for the, for the event. Um, newspapers are very good about that because they talk about it being a lovely, fine and clear day. Um, so it was a beautiful, typical, uh, you know, uh, Queensland uh, you know, winter day and everything like that. Just like today. Oh, yeah, very much so, actually, here. Yeah. And the trains that were going to depart and everything like that, uh, there was one at 10am, uh, 10.20, 10.41, okay, so it was, you know, 20 minutes apart. The Vice Regal train, however, which is one carrying the go Governor of Queensland and uh, the, uh, the official party there, it was to leave at 11am. Um, and uh, apparently there was large crowds that actually gathered outside for the um, you know, actually gathered outside of the Ipswich railway station for the event and everything like that. Um, the other interesting thing was the papers of the day were you know, looking and they were saying, well, you know, what was it like, you know, the opening of the railway? The Daily Guardian actually, Guardian actually uh, it said that, um, look, accepting a little more than the ordinary bustle of a railway terminus at home, there's not a great deal to distinguish the scene yesterday of our first grand adventure into lo railway locomotion. Now, the train guards were just as railway guards usually are. I love this description because, you know, it reminds me of so many railway guards I grew up with. Big, bluff, good-humoured looking fellows with big beards, you know. Um, although, the papers said they had lousy uniforms. And they said, you know, said they were described as being abominably ugly costumes. And uh, they said they should have had something like a smart fitting suit you know, that was provided for them or something like that that would have been preferred as well, you know, Annette. So that's what they um, obviously decided. Um, and all I can say is, you know, criticism of the railway uniform began very early in Queensland history, as you'd appreciate. So, At least yeah. now our winter uniform is quite nice. <laughs> yeah, well, that's exactly right. Mm. And we mentioned locomotives before. Apparently, locomotive number one came out from its engine shed at, um, uh, at uh, Ipswich, um, popping Which, on the whistle. Interestingly, mm. it wasn't. Mm. How do I say it? Fug. The Not Fug of no, Fug no. No, that's right. Now that was interesting because again, you know, it was uh, the numbering the locomotives and the naming. You know, uh, Fug of was number two. Uh, locomotive number one, I think it was. Uh, was it Leighton? I don't think it was Lady Bowen. I'll have to check the history notes on it anyway. But yeah, but uh, apparently it came out and uh, you know. They were polished until they gleamed. They were absolutely beautiful. You know, newspaper accounts said how beautifully they were all polished and everything like that. And the other thing, they had like lots of greenery hanging off and like they had uh, evergreens and they said there were palm fronds hanging off the lakes motors. They were, you know, polished up, decorated absolutely beautifully sort of thing, you know, for, for the big event. We mentioned before, Annette, you know, about the um, about locomotive number one coming out and the trains moving out, the four of them, you know, the Vice Regal train. Um, well, the first one actually moved out at Ellenborough Street, which is at Ipswich, uh, the original Ipswich station, left at 10.05. Um, they all ran late on the day too. That's, <laughs> that's something not to be, anyway, but it was our first adventure into the railway era and everything like that. Um, the train that conveyed the Vice Regal party, they left a bit later after um, 11 o'clock to rousing cheers. There's also a, a special salute from Cannon that the Ipswich Volunteer Artillery had set out. So, I mean, can imagine this day and age, you know, train setting out for a new journey and you've basically got, you know, a couple of cannon firing off as well too, you know. So I don't think workplace health and safety would approve somehow of that anyway, you know. So, yeah, that was it. So I left and, um, yeah, the newspaper accounts was... Um, you know, it was a beautiful day. Uh, the morning, indeed, the entire day continued remarkably fine and clear. Each train passed through the multitudes of people that had assembled. So they're all you know, there to see, you know, the first steam trains head out and everything like that. They all wanted to witness history, you know, with the departure of those trains. Um, the papers of the day actually said um, it was, uh, you know, it was, yeah, they couldn't help but feel it was under the happiest and most cheering auspices that the first Queensland Railway was being opened anyhow, you know. Um, were our trains truck a block back in those days? And interestingly enough, um, there were accounts that not all the trains ran out, you know, put passengers on the train. They actually left people behind on the platform. Um, that's probably explained by the fact it was, you know, our first mass transit event or something like that, and just trying to get people onto trains. And, you know, a lot of them, you know, were turning out for the first time for this special event. So I don't think in this day and age, I don't think how it, um, it would be, you know, well received that, you know, people being left behind for a special event or something like that and heading out on the trains uh, that went with it anyway, you know. But, um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was still very much an experiment. And I guess, you know, the um, you know, opening a railway for the first time in Queensland, it was... The first time we'd done it, basically, as well. 
So they travelled out, uh, Biggs Camp. Um, there was nothing remarkable about the countryside. There was no grand or glorious scenery or anything like that. Uh, one traveller on the train actually described it as dull, dreary and monotonous, you know. <laughs> um, it was said to consist of dreary flat of scrub and forest, an endless vista of skeleton-like gum trees, rugged-looking ironbark trees. Um, occasionally you could see, you know, through the window, you know, through the open window, you'd see uh, glimpses of a cottage or a, a, a shanty in the bushes that was described. And the thing I always loved was that they said it was uh, surrounded by uh, banana trees or growing corn as well, you know. So, um, so <laughs> they're willing looking after their, um, <laughs> well, basically they're looking after their garden and everything like that in the home garden. So, yeah. So it was, it was remarkable. The line, well, again, with that thing about the uh, narrow gauge, it was sharp curves, you know, steep pinches and climbs and everything like that. Um, the, um, some of the people who travelled on from Brisbane Koori were a little bit worried because they thought the ride was a bit rough and everything like that and they're uh, you know, running around you know, for, for the curves and everything like that. Um, well, but they have been going at a much faster pace than what they were used to as well. Annette, bang on, exactly. This, I mean, this was the first time in Queensland probably that they'd actually exceeded the speed limit. I mean, on the day, that they're probably getting up to about 35, 40 kilometres an hour and some of the timetabling we've got, I mean, some of those tra trains can be running about 45 kilometre an hour, getting close to, you know, 25, 30 mile an hour. And I mean, the fastest, you know, people had travelled then was literally with a racehorse or something like that. So, so literally, you know, it was travelling and it was travelling fast for the first time. Um, and... You were really good with your observation there about that, you know, about that combination of things, about, uh, you know, people's understanding of it. Like newspapers, the thing I loved was they described it as basically the engine drive was like a jockey and they were trying to compare it to something that they were familiar with and they said, like, the driver in the engine was like a jockey on a racehorse, you know, and he's moving uh, levers and throttles and everything like that and uh, basically he was very careful with it and, you know, observing, um, you know, the speed, uh, speed restrictions and things like that. Um, and that was the thing they loved about, like he was like a jockey on a horse. And that's the thing I love, you know, people were comparing it to something they're very familiar with. So readers could have a look and try and understand what they were, what they were witnessing. So I said, like a jockey on a horse, you know, so <laughs> I always have a mental image. A lot of engine drivers I grew up with and everything like that. Yeah, I couldn't imagine them being jockeys anyway, Annette, or anything <laughs> like that. You described them earlier, yeah, they don't sound like a jockey to me. <laughs> no, they certainly don't anyway, but yeah. So anyway, yeah, but the line was described as a bits and dips and kind of steep climbs and um, yeah, the uh, uh, there's a couple of tight curves and that, uh, you know, the train could only get around something about eight mile an hour, which is what, about uh, 12, 13 kilometres an hour in the modern currency and that. Um, and the newspaper correspondent said, uh, wonderful, oh, the train made a very graceful sweep in, around it indeed. If anything connected with locomotives can be called graceful or at a stately pace or something like that anyway. So, yeah, that was quite remarkable. Um, how would the passengers have felt? Would it have been a treacherous trip? Would it have been a nice smooth sailing trip like we have now? That's a really good question as well. Again, it was about the expectations and what people. And I do have a mental image of the uh, lady, ladies of Colonial Queensland, you know, just in their crinolines and everything like that, having a bit of a shriek or something like that. So they might have hit, you know, a rough patch in the ballast or uh, going around the curves and that. I guess we think it might have been treacherous, you know, a bit of a rough ride, but, you know, it was a railway that had been passed, you know, for, for operation. Um, there were railway professionals all over the place, like the engine drivers, you know, the station masters, everybody and things like that. They were all the professionals and everything that went with it as well. So although it might seem like treacherous to us in this day and age, I mean, it was a railway. They've been building these railways for, you know, you know for a couple of decades now. Um, it was an imported railway, so the experience was all there and everything like that. So probably, you know, we'd think it might have been um, you know, treacherous. It would, might, it would have been a bit of a rough ride and everything like that. No more rougher than they probably they were used to, yeah. Oh, OK. The... Um We've talked about, about how quickly our railway was up and running. Mm. Do you think that they sped things up a little bit for the opening? They would have had pressure put on them, definitely. Try and get that first section, try and get it, you know, the contractors themselves, they said, well, contract and, you know, how many months, you know, to build that first section line, get that up and running. So, you know, the pressure then, if you go over on the contract, we mentioned, you mentioned earlier before, you pay for it to net anyway. So, yeah, which is what you don't want. I think it was still remarkable because, you know, um, you know, they did talk about the professional of the railway workers, apart from their uniforms and things like that. But um, look, although the railway's gotten to service quickly, it was deemed safe for traffic for the carriage of passengers. And I think the remarkable thing is that period, you know, five years, 1865 to 1870, 
233 kilometres of narrow gauge railway was built in Queensland. It's remarkable. And look, the railway promoters and builders of the day, they had to contend with a newly created colony of a huge area, the tiny population, limited infrastructure, uh, not much in the way of finances because the colony went broke in the, later on in 1866 and that. Um, there was competing, competing uh, political and economic interests. We want a railway, I want a railway, you know, and everything like that. I mean, their work was a significant achievement and uh, combined with the major engineering challenges that presented by the Little Liverpool range and then the main range eventually when the line got up here, I mean, that period of railway construction was absolutely remarkable that earlier in Queensland anyway, so yeah. yeah. Did they have to build many bridges to get our railway going? Oh, they did. Actually, there were four major bridges on that first bit of work. Uh, there was um, Iron Pot Creek, there's the one across the Bremer River Bridge. That actually was a road rail bridge. So it was combined, you know, so um, okay. horse and cart with the iron horse. And actually, if you had to cross that um, and uh, you were leading, they actually had a flagman to, uh, uh, escort the train across the bridge uh, with a red flag and basically warning people with uh, that here comes a steam train. So it's literally going at walking pace across that first bridge. There were four other bridges. There's Iron Pot Creek, there was the Bremer and two other. And then, again, the iron work for that, and then it came from Britain. Again, it was forged in Britain, bought here and then assembled, you know, by people who knew how to do these things. There were trestle bridges and, that, and a lot of bridges because um, a lightweight railway that we had here in Queensland made use of a lot of timber as well too. So, Are yeah. any of those bridges still standing, the four uh, ironworks ones? They're not now. Part of the right of way, as we call it in the railways, used for a bike trail now from uh, Ipswich, North Ipswich to the Walkeracker. So the uh, Brisbane Valley Rail Trail? It's actually uh, before that and as I said, maybe I look forward to seeing you getting out on your bike and with the kids there at some stage and experimenting on it anyway. I have done some of the Brisbane Rail Trail ah, already. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll have to go back a bit further back to Walkeracker. But the ironwork for some of those early bridges is still used in, on bridges here in Queensland today. It's actually, I think, one up near Meribur, a pedestrian bridge, and they actually used that, you know, part of that ironwork was recycled. And they used to do that, recycle it onto other bridges. So the spirit of 1865 is still very strong, literally in, you know, very other parts of Queensland sort of thing, you know. I'll be honest in that. As a historian and person, I really wish I could have been there to witness it, you know, because the people that they knew they were making history, um, I would like to have been there to witness it and see, you know, people's reactions and that. But um, but to get back to that opening day, yeah, the, uh, the first train, it stopped at Walloon. Uh, it got in at Biggs Camp at 11.06, and that was just over an hour for a run of 21 miles. So, you know, it gives you an idea, even with a stop. Did it stop at Biggs Camp? I thought it would bypass Big Camp. Oh, well, when they got through to Biggs Camp, and then they go up the extra mile or two up the line there. They stopped at Walloon, but, uh, you know, it's an hour for a 21-mile journey. I mean, wow, you know, that's, that's you know, speeding, you know. Um, the Vice Regal Party, you know, they got in at, um, they got in where they at about 1.20 in the afternoon, I think it was. Uh, we mentioned before, there's Biggs Camp Station and trains go up and they continue up, you know, to put their passengers uh, detrain and then they can go up on the hillside and, you know, have all the fun there at the um, Grand Marquis and everything like that. Why couldn't they stop at Biggs Camp? Well, basically, I think it was one of those things that you, because a half-completed station, but I think it was the, to give the impression and I think it was to make a statement, I suppose you'd say, in this day and age in there. And the statement was basically about those tunnelling works on the Little Liverpool Range Railway. Um, and also the railway works. And uh, um, there's an interesting story, and I'm happy to tell you it now. The story is that there was um, a sapling or a, there was a seedling that was planted from Morton Bay fig tree by Lady Bowen on the day of the opening. And the story is that it is still there today. Um, we're fairly sure in the railway, actually, um, we lo we've located where that marquee took place. And we're reasonably sure of the location where it was. And I can say one thing today, if you know that area around Grantchester and the area beyond, there is a very large Morton Bay fig tree up on the hillside. And uh, I mean, the story is correct about that. It's entirely possible. But uh, we're reasonably confident with historical research over the past couple of years, we've identified where the, where the marquee and that was. And we might, one of these days we'll divulge it, you know, secret railway historian business or something like that. You well, know, it would so. be interesting to see a then and now, like, because they walked up and they could see the tunnelling yeah. works so and they could see Biggs Camp, mm. what it would be like now if we went for a walk and we found this Morton <laughs> Bay fig. Well, I think it's lovely, you know, if there's if that story is true, you know, and I've, I've seen the area, you know, at the Morton Bay fig tree, I hope it's true anyway. It's, it's one of those wonderful railway tales that go with it, you know. 
So if we're there back on the 30, 31st of July, um, sumptuous luncheon, lots of champagne toast, lots and lots and lots of long-winded speeches, you know, um, and lots of, uh, God save uh, the Queen uh, uh, toast and everything like that. Um, and then the trains departed. They got their guests back at about 6 p.m., and that was in time for that grand ball and everything like that. And that you, I think you got a bit of an interest in that coming from the clothing variety. Yeah, so... It's just interesting. So they've been out to their luncheon. Mm-hmm. They've had the day. They've had their lunch, their champagne. They've got back on the train. Then they're in town. Mm-hmm. They get back in town just in time for the ball. So are they fully dressed in their ball gown during <laughs> lunch as well, ready oh, to go? That's a really good point. I actually had, I had to ask around and ask my wife about that one as well too. It's possible they might have had a bit of a quick change provided for them. But the ladies and that, of course, you know, crinolines and everything like that, the gentlemen would have been on their full suits and everything like that. I guess the one thing is at least they weren't burning coal on the steam locomotives. They, they, they burnt wood timber. They did that for um, up until the 1870s. So it shouldn't have been too smoky for them, you know, or too too um, uh, you know, too black from coal dust or coal smoke or anything like that. But, um, yeah, it's an interesting question. And, again, you know, there might have been a quick change involved. Otherwise, they might have rolled from one to the other sort of thing, you know. And, um, yeah, it's interesting. And I've seen some of those dresses. I can't imagine there's a quick change to be had there. <laughs> yeah, with a crinoline or something like that for the uh, with the corsets and all those sorts of things but uh, yeah it's a very good point net. and again oh, what a pity we couldn't have been there to ask you asked and then, are you sure you should be going out dressed like that sort of thing you know so exactly we talk about this day of age of uh, you know coordinated travel the world of um, you know go-karts and everything like that what was more remarkable about it net was actually from when that railway opened from its switch to Biggs Camp July of 1865 there was coordinated travel available we had a coordinated ticket, you know, 156 years ago, you know, allowing you to go from Brisbane to Toowoomba and uh, part by train, part by stagecoach, and uh, that's how they did. It's quite remarkable, you know. Fantastic, the forethought, isn't it? Well, basically, yeah, you know, they've, they've been doing it for a generation or two and they're getting into it, you know. I imagine the, the navvies in that who probably celebrated, you know, as well too on the opening of that first section the next day, 1st of August, well, they would have been getting on with building the railway line up here, up the Toowoomba Range in the sections there. Um, you probably would have heard, you know, basically, you know, of a pick and shovel going on. You would have seen, you know, literally hundreds of uh, workers stretching off into the distance. They're working on the tunnels, you know, they're working on those works going up towards Toowoomba and that. You might have um, actually heard, you know, the crump of a uh, blasting powder being used in some of the works and that. So, you know, it would have been that hive of activity would have been continuing off from the 1st of August and that. And um, there's a lovely, lovely story. Alice Freer, um, Mori French, he's a, a historian in Toowoomba. He came across a lovely account in a book that he wrote called Travellers in the Landscape. It was about, you know, people's visions of, you know, the Darling Downs and that. And he came across in August 1865 this lovely account by a lady by the name of Alice Freer. And she recalled her experience of travelling on a narrow gauge railway here in Queensland. And she said, next day we sent on the carriage and horses by an early train to Biggs Camp. And just interesting, the horse and the carriage were carried on the train to Biggs Camp. So they had horse wagons, they would put the horses in. They would have had like a flat wagon, they would have put their carriage on as well. So, you know, coordinated travel and that. Um, She's described it as, it was the only piece of railroad yet opened in Queensland. Well, railroad, railway, thank you very much. The funny thing is, you know, not quite accurate. The gauge is all of but three feet, well, 1,067 millimetres. And she said they could not with anything wider have managed the sharp curves, which frequently occur in the course of the 21 miles. So again, you know, the economy measures as we spoke about. The carriages take three persons abreast. Well, in this day and age, it'd be interesting to see how many they could take sort of thing. But to enable them to do so, they're made to project considerably on either side of the wheels. So going around some of the sharpest curves, one can easily see into the next carriage but one. I think that might have been a little bit, but, you know, the idea of the, the curves, the tight curves and looking to the next carriage and things like that. The lovely thing that Ellis said, an old woman in our carriage was very proud of this little bit of railroad. And I think that's just a lovely thing, you know, obviously an older woman, you know, a settler here in Queensland and that, and still very proud of those first, you know, 21 miles of railway. Well... We spoke about before that little bit of railway. Um, it was extended further westward. Um, in April of 1866, they got across the Liverpool Range. Um, they got through a partially completed Victoria Tunnel, which is the longest uh, tunnel on a bore on the system. 1st of June of 1866, they got through to Gatton. And, but the major ascent, which is up here to Toowoomba, that didn't open until 1st of May 1867. But um, I'll have to say about that one, Annette, as we say, that's another story for another time anyway. Thanks so much for listening to our first episode. 
If you've enjoyed the podcast, please leave a comment, review, or follow us for more episodes. If you have any Queensland Rail history questions you'd love for Greg to cover, please message us on the Queensland Rail Facebook or Instagram pages. This is the Queensland Rail History Podcast with a new episode every month. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.